Book 2, To the Killing Fields, from November 4th to December 14th, 1914. It was Wednesday, November 4th, and they were set to depart for the front this day. Barthas was part of a 50-man detachment that was going to reinforce the 280th Infantry Regiment, which was fighting near Bethune and La Bazé in northern France. Barthas's wife had come to Narbonne together with their six-year-old son, André, in order to say farewell. She was determined to stay by Barthas's side as long as possible. Out of pity, the authorities allowed the wives of those who were leaving to stay in the barracks courtyards with their husbands until the last moment. Then the bugle sounded and the men were called to assembly. Barthas hugged and kissed his wife one last time and asked her to please not go to the station to see him off, else he might lose what little courage he had left. Filled with sadness, she went away slowly, pulling André by the arm. The child could not understand the situation and simply started crying for his father. Barthas wondered if he would ever see them again and started crying, but he had to pull himself together. They could not march down the town's streets with eyes full of tears. Everyone put on a steady, serious face. The Commandant Manival had assigned an escort of drums and bugles with them, and they attracted a big crowd on their way to the station. But this was no longer the cheerful and enthusiastic crowd of the first departures. There were no flowers, no kisses, no hurrahs. This short war announced by the papers was turning long. France had been invaded, winter was close and the outcome uncertain. On many of the faces in the crowd, Barthas could see pity. Women wiped their eyes and everyone was grave and silent. Many uncovered their heads, just like when a column of condemned men pass. The soldiers climbed onto the freight cars, threw down their packs and sat or crouched in silence as the train departed. The journey was long and painful. At the town of Nîmes, the train was put on a siding, but the soldiers could not get off the train and rest because it could leave at any moment, so they had to spend the entire night shivering inside the freight car, though Barthas remarks that no one complained. They eventually departed in the morning. In the afternoon, they got down at the town of Lete for a meal break. The day's menu consisted of a hunk of bread, a mug of broth and a cup of coffee. Suddenly they saw women and children entering the station with baskets full of fruit, chocolate, wine and jars of preserves. They were touched, being reminded of the gifts they had been given before in places like Roussillon. But alas, nothing was free anymore. If the soldiers wanted to complement their meager meals with something more, they had to pay out of their own pockets. After their meal, they got back on the train and resumed their journey. By that night, they reached the town of Lyon, and, after many more stops, by the next evening they were at Le Bourget, where they spent the next 24 hours lodged in their cattle cars without any distribution of food. They were not informed when the train was due to depart, and no one dared to get down for fear of being left behind. Finally, at nightfall, the train headed north. By sunrise the next day, they reached St. Paul, a small market town in the Pas de Calais, which with the war had become an important railway junction. As an aside, Barthas comments that with the approach of winter, the soldiers wished to warm themselves with a cup of coffee. They had more than enough coffee tablets and sugar in their food reserves, but no boiling water. Then one of them had the bright idea of asking the train's engineer for some boiling water from the engine, and they managed to make a great pot of coffee on the spot. 
After that, they reached the end of their journey by rail on November 8th at 9 in the morning. The rest would be on foot. In his diary, Parthas notes the irony that the station at which they disembarked was called Berlin. The sides of their freight cars were scrawled with messages in chalk that said, Death to Wilhelm, on to Berlin, on to Berlin. But they were only one letter and a thousand kilometers away from Berlin. It was at Berlin that Barthas first heard the sound of cannons from the front, far away in the fog. He turned towards its general direction, but the fog made it impossible to see anything. Emerging from the fog were the silhouettes of large, pyramid-like hills. When he asked the locals, he was told they were slag heaps. They were in coal mining country. Then they headed out. By noon, the soldiers reached the mining town of Nelemin, where they had a long stop for rest and then resumed their journey. By nightfall, they arrived exhausted at the town of Noyel, the place where they were supposed to meet the 280th Infantry Regiment. But it was not there. After asking around, they were told that the regiment was at another village called Anecan. It also turned out that they had been extremely lucky, because two kilometers from Noyel, the road was wide open to the view of German machine guns and artillery, but the fog had prevented them from being spotted in that kill zone. They had just arrived and already had a close brush with death. They turned back with all haste and finally reached the village of Anneka in the dark of night. There they found the reserve companies of the 280th Regiment. Anneka was a wounded town. Bullets would frequently whistle through the streets and everywhere there were houses that had been pulverized by shells. It was empty of its original inhabitants. Everyone had run away from the danger and only the soldiers remained. When they arrived, they were led into a schoolhouse where they slept on small patches of damp straw. In the middle of the night, they were suddenly awoken by a series of explosions that shook the entire building. The soldiers were frightened, but it turned out to be a battery of 75 mm cannons from their own side that had moved closer during the night to fire a few shells at the German lines. The German batteries answered to this with several time-fused shells that detonated nearby. The shrapnel splattered on the roof of the school and broke a few tiles. Some of the soldiers fled terrified into the night. Others crawled under the benches and tables that were piled up in one of the corners of the classroom. In these conditions, the night felt eternal. But eventually morning came, and with it the time for them to be assigned to different companies. Barthas asked to be assigned to the 21st Company, which was commanded by Captain Léon Houdel, a fellow Periasois and childhood friend of Barthas. However, the Captain Adjutant Major responsible for the assignments did not pay attention to this request and assigned him to the 22nd Company. The company was on the front line, and Barthas would have to join it up at nightfall. But nightfall was many hours away, so when the morning fog cleared a little, Barthas headed to the town's outskirts to observe the fields. He knew the front line was barely two kilometers away, but all that he could see were piles of earth and swellings off the ground, all vague, imprecise. The silence was absolute, and it was difficult to imagine that so close to him men were killing each other. Just as he was turning to go back to the village, he spotted three figures that emerged from the trenches and were heading towards him. He discovered with horror that they were completely covered in mud, from their shoes to their caps and the tips of their mustaches. What was stranger still was that these figures suddenly started making signs towards him and calling him by name. He was shocked when the figures came to him, 
shook his hand and embraced him, and then he finally recognized them. They were three of his comrades from his hometown of Periac, Gabriel Gilles, François Maisonave, and Louis Jordi. They had left Narbonne to go to the front on the 31st of October, barely five days before Barthas, and they were already in an unrecognizable state. The four of them had tears in their eyes at finding each other. Gilles, Maisonave and Jordi shared with Barthas their sad stories. On the front line they could barely rest. Every night they had to attack, patrol or dig. The machine guns never stopped firing and it drove men mad. They routinely had to lie in the mud without moving for hours at a time and it rained every day. They had no shelters and received only meager food. Barthas was heartbroken when he listened to these things and knew he would soon share their fate. His comrades told him that when they heard of the arrival of fresh reinforcements, they asked to come to Anneka on work detail to see if there was anyone they knew amongst them. They had met Barthas on the way. Later that day, it was Barthas' turn to depart for the trenches. At six in the evening, he, together with five comrades, left the village with an orderly that served as guide. The orderly gave them the following advice. Do just as I do. When I drop, you drop. When I hit the ground, you hit the ground, no matter where. If I run, you run like hell. The five of them took this advice to heart. They had to cross open country where bullets constantly whistled. Barthas describes that at this early stage of the war, the machine guns on both sides fired all day long and all night long with almost no interruption, while the artillery fire was relatively weak. Also at this early stage, no communication trenches had been built which meant that most relief parties and work details were marked by accidents, often fatal in nature. The journey was long and painful. They crossed a prairie that had more in common with marshland and tripped over sugar beets in fields they couldn't make out in the dark. Then they followed the railroad track that had been destroyed by shell fire. The shells had twisted the rails, dug holes and knocked telegraph poles over. In the darkness they hit all these obstacles, hurting their legs and knees. They only covered two kilometers that night, but Bartha says that no subsequent relief trek felt longer or more painful than that one. In the middle of the night they suddenly found themselves sweating and breathless inside a narrow, muddy ditch. This was their destination and bedroom for their first night. They would not be assigned to squads until the next day. They had traveled five days in a cattle car. They had spent one night of terror in the school in Anneka and had carried out the exhausting night march just to reach that muddy ditch. They had been completely broken by fatigue and simply covered themselves with their flimsy blankets and slept right there and then, without caring about the cold, the bullets that whistled above them, the enemies that were so close, or the passers-by that stepped on their feet and legs. Despite his exhaustion, Barthas was awakened in the middle of the night by the sound of picks and shovels working nearby. He peeked his head over the parapet and asked the soldiers what they were doing. They answered that they were burying the dead from the last assault. Barthas realized then to his horror that he was surrounded by dead men that were buried under only a few shovelfuls of dirt. As he looked over the parapet he saw to his right a great fire in the distance that lit up the landscape with a lugubrious light. It came from a large haystack that the Germans had set on fire to observe the area for at this point of the war flares were not yet commonplace. At dawn they were given their only meal for the entire day, 
a mug of cold coffee, a piece of meat, and bread splattered with mud. With the arrival of daylight, Barthas decided to observe his surroundings from a hiding spot behind some bushes. To his right, he saw a pile of ruins that had once been a mining town called Vermel. The French artillery had been focusing its fire on Vermel to try and dislodge the Germans that were occupying it. Barthas then talked with a veteran who pointed out to his left a village called Givenchy le Labazé, which he said marked the end of the sector that was held by their English allies. Behind them was Anneka, and Barthas was surprised to see that it was so close despite how long their night march had felt. Around Vermel there were many of the haystacks that were used as enormous torches during the night. On the fields he could occasionally see dark shapes over which crows circled. These were French and German corpses. Barthas comments that these corpses would not be buried until the 7th of December, when the Germans withdrew from the area. During the day they received the news that their company, the 22nd, would pull back to Anaka to rest for two days. The painful night journey that Barthas and his comrades had gone through had been pointless. The return to the village was just as tiring and even longer. It took the company an hour and a half to cross the fields that were constantly swept by machine gun fire. There was a particular spot of open field that was squarely in the sights of a German machine gun, and they had to cross it one by one through a torrent of bullets. Bartha said that it was a miracle that they only had one man wounded. When they reached Anneka, they were billeted in the village's church. It had a few broken window panes, but the openings had been filled with cassocks and other bits of ecclesiastical ornament. The church had been built before the town had coal mines or taverns, so it was very small and they had to pack themselves tightly. Barthas slept on a bit of high altar step. The soldiers were afraid because the church was in full view of the Germans and a single big artillery shell could have wiped out the entire company. That night shells did fall around the church, but luckily none of them exploded. Bartha says that some time later, after the German withdrawal of the 7th of December, shells did hit the church directly and claimed victims among the civilians that had been attending a service there. Barthas also comments that after the night in the church he went to the village and witnessed with sadness and anger the results of the looting that had been carried out by fellow soldiers from other companies. It was a scene that evoked the one witnessed at Montlouis. It was not simply that the soldiers had been looking for food and drink, any and all locked doors and cupboards had been forced open in the search for anything of value. Linen, utensils, beds and furniture had all been trampled and broken. Portraits, diplomas, religious paintings, marriage certificates and souvenirs of First Communions were strewn over the ground like garbage. It was as if a band of burglars had pillaged the town. A single story that serves as an example of the level of lootings was the priest of Anaka, who before his departure had locked up the sacred objects, such as chalices, crosses and incense burners, in a cupboard in the presbytery. The cupboard had an inscription that the house and everything in it was at the disposal of the soldiers. He simply asked them to respect this cupboard. This did not prevent some from breaking the cupboard and stealing everything inside. When the priest eventually returned to the town, he wrote a letter to the regimental colonel protesting this theft, remarking that while the regiment had been fighting in German-occupied Alsace, men were punished with prison terms for stealing an apple, but on French soil such horrible vandalism and profanation were tolerated 
It seems that, despite the priest's protests, not much happened in the end. But returning to the life of the soldiers, while in town they still received very little food, so Barthas, together with his comrade Kurtad, a man who had accompanied him since Montlouis, decided to go to a city called Bethune, six kilometers away from Anneka, in order to get some provisions. They knew that the Germans expected to capture Bethune soon, so they did not shell it. Parthas and Kurtar left Aneka that afternoon and went along a wide paved highway. After walking three kilometers they reached the mining town of Beuvry, which was being bombarded by the Germans. To their surprise, none of the locals seemed to pay the bombardment any attention. It turned out that the Germans only bombarded a single part of the town, which had already been evacuated by its residents. The bombardment was at worst an inconvenience, for the road passed through that part of town and so all the traffic had to wait patiently for its end. Here, Barthas and Kurtad found all kinds of provisions, so they filled up their rucksacks and decided to make their way back to Anneka, postponing their visit to Bethune. When they returned, their comrades were very surprised by what they had done. They explained to them that leaving the camp was forbidden and soldiers who were discovered would face a court-martial. Only the bravest dared to do so. When Barthas and Kurtal complained that if they didn't leave the camp then they could very well starve, their comrades shared a secret. There was one particular soldier from the company who every day escaped the camp and crossed the fields towards Bethune risking discovery and court-martial, and returned in the evening with a bag full of whatever it was that had been asked for. He went through such risks to earn a couple of coins. This soldier was never denounced or discovered. And so the two days of rest passed quickly, and on the 12th of November at six in the evening they were on their way back to the trenches. The routine of Barthes' section was the following. For every eight days on the front-line trenches, they would spend four in reserve. Right now it was their turn to spend four days in the reserve lines. When they arrived, feeling their way through the darkness, Barthes and Kurtad had to make themselves at home inside one of several little holes that were dug into an embankment. They spent their first night sleeping inside that hole, and then had to spend four hours digging a trench each night for the rest of their stay in the reserve lines. The embankment they were dug in ended at a railroad track. At this spot their commandant, a man called Lianas, had made himself a little cabin that was like a luxurious palace compared to the holes the soldiers had to sleep in. Barthas describes this Commandant Lianas as a man of great bravery, but who was just as careless with the lives of others as he was with his own. The railroad track was on an embankment about two meters tall. Any soldier who tried to climb that railroad track to get to the other side was at the risk of being spotted and shot at by the Germans, so a narrow trench had been dug that cut across and underneath the embankment allowing soldiers to cross to the other side safe from enemy fire. Commandant Lianas apparently did not like this safe trench and had strictly forbidden anyone and everyone from using it, no matter whether it was night or day. So work details and relief units had to move up and along that railroad track, completely exposed to enemy fire. Additionally, the heavy rains had turned the land and embankment into a swamp, and still the commandant forced his soldiers to climb over this two-meter-high, swampy and fully exposed embankment. He did not care that sometimes the German bullets found victims. Barthas wondered if Lianas thought that in this way he would get his men used to the sound of bullets. Other superiors were also rather unpleasant. On one occasion, Barthas and a few other soldiers were on relief duty at night 
As they moved along the passageways, an officer that apparently had had too much to drink appeared. He was annoyed at the noise the soldiers were supposedly making as they moved, and so this officer decided to punish the men by keeping them lined up along the railroad track for ten long minutes as bullets whistled around them. Luckily, no one was hit. After those four days in reserve, the section had to move up in the dark of night towards the front-line trenches. At this time of the war, no communication trenches had been built, and so they had to sprint across three to four hundred meters of open ground that was sprayed with machine gun fire. After running like madmen, they fell exhausted into the trench, which Barthas described as one of the crude constructions they built, before the Germans taught them how it was done. Their trench was little more than a hole in the ground, with no barbed wire, no parapets, no loopholes, no firing steps and no shelters. A wide and shallow stream ran along its bottom. Bartha says that this trench, that would have been crude to a Roman legionnaire, was a precious refuge to the Poilus. Their position was also rather unpleasant. To their right, a sluggish stream had created a swamp that isolated them from the neighboring company, while to their left there was a large stretch of trench that had been completely abandoned because a determined German battery fired on that spot day and night as if it were of monumental strategic value. It was clear that their half-section was completely isolated and with no possibility of falling back in the case of an attack or bombardment. This place could easily turn into their grave. Cortad and Barthas spent the night near each other. The darkness was so total that nothing could be seen two paces away. Everyone was afraid and jumped at shadows and imaginary Germans. The terrified sentinel sounded the alarm about twenty times throughout the night, and everyone fired desperately into the darkness like madmen. It felt endless, and everyone was thankful when the first rays of light appeared. But their relief was short-lived, for soon a new enemy appeared. The rain. This was the winter rain of Flanders. It was a deluge that hit them with big, fat raindrops, and at this point in time they did not have any tents. Kurtad and Barthas searched for some way to make a shelter. They managed to unearth a German overcoat that was splattered with mud and coagulated blood. They draped it over two broken rifles and stretched it across the trench to make themselves a crude tent. It was not perfect. Streams of reddish-brown water soaked through the cloth and fell over their heads, necks and clothes. But it was a shelter that made many of the other soldiers envious. It kept raining throughout the entire day and night. The walls of the trench crumbled and the landslide served as dams that accumulated water in certain parts of it. The stream to the right expanded and they seemed to find themselves inside a vast lake. The sentries no longer kept watch and everyone looked for shelter from the rain and collapsing walls. Some abandoned the trench while others worked to dig individual holes that collapsed almost immediately. When daylight broke they only received fog and yet more November rain. When it finally stopped, the Poilus had to clean up the landslides and let the water run out. Their only source of warmth was their work with picks and shovels. The next night the sky cleared up and they witnessed a spectacle of otherworldly beauty. Thousands of stars were sprinkled across the sky and around a big bright silver moon. But together with this beauty came cold winds and the temperature plummeted. Their soaked overcoats and blankets stiffened with frost and their feet were numbed with the cold. Barthas had to take off his shoes despite it being forbidden by regulations to rub his feet with a little brandy in order to keep them warm. <laughs>
When the ration team arrived at daybreak, they could not serve the soldiers coffee. It had frozen in its containers on the journey to the frontline trench. Barthas recalls that one of the worst tortures the soldiers faced in the trenches was thirst. At this time, Pinard, cheap red wine, was not yet part of the soldiers' daily rations, and all they had to drink was the cup of coffee that was brought up each morning. This could not satisfy the thirst caused by the dry and spicy food they had to consume, and the type of trench fever that they all seemed to suffer from. That day, when the coffee container froze over, brought a thirst so terrible that the soldiers could hardly talk. Kurtada and Barthas agreed that they desperately had to look for something, anything to drink, and quench their thirst. It would have been easy enough to take a couple of steps and drink from the stream that ran along the bottom of the trench, but the idea of drinking these waters terrified them. It was not just that the water was dirty, but they had seen on their first day the stream running between bushes and reeds and washing German and French corpses along its course. Despite the disgust and fear this caused in the soldiers, some were so desperate that they ended up drinking from that corrupted stream, for the pain brought by thirst is far greater than that of hunger. And so, Barthas and Kurtat decided to quietly slip out of the trench to look for water, risking a court-martial and a firing squad in the process. They followed the trench to their left and soon arrived at the abandoned section that was under constant shell fire. The shells, together with the heavy rain, had heavily damaged the trench and it was practically impassable. They had to move carefully, bent double. At one point the trench disappeared thanks to the damage it had sustained, and so they had to crawl on the mud. Despite these efforts, they were spotted by the Germans and bullets splattered around them. But they managed to proceed without being injured and eventually reached the part where the trench crossed the railroad tracks, near where their dangerous commandant had made his den. Luck was on their side and they managed to slip unnoticed and soon reached Anneka, though not without feeling the whistle of bullets in certain areas where the enemy machine guns were constantly aimed. At Anneka, they managed to slake their thirst and fill their canteens with the water from the well, which wasn't exactly crystal clear, but at least did not bathe any corpses, and it was fresh and delicious for them. Barthas comments in this part of his diary that it was clear that if war brought bitter physical sufferings like cold, hunger, thirst, sleeplessness, it also brought an equally high degree of satisfaction when those sufferings were relieved. Few can really appreciate what it means to have a good fire, a good bed, and a good meal. Their return to the trench was just as tiring and unpleasant, but fortunately without incidents. They reached the trench without anyone ever discovering their escapade. The last day of their frontline duty, the men received orders to use overcoats and other effects taken from dead or wounded men to create scarecrows in French uniforms that they then had to stick to the end of their bayonets. They were not told what the purpose of these scarecrows was until the evening. That very night before the moon rose, the Germans, as was their routine, ignited one of their haystacks to illuminate the fields like a gigantic torch. Then one of the French 75s fired as a signal, and the French line unleashed a furious fusillade of rifle fire. After a few minutes they were given the order to shake their crude mannequins on their bayonets to simulate an attack. The Germans took the bait and unleashed a violent salvo of their own. This had been the French command's goal, and with the Germans up and alert in their trenches, batteries of 75s hidden behind the slag heaps immediately carried out a brutal bombardment of the German positions. <laughs> 
As a result of this, all of the sector was very lively throughout the night and no one got any sleep. After they survived through that night and into the next day, Parthas's unit started to prepare. They were due to leave the front line that very evening. Despite all they had gone through, no one in the half section had been killed or wounded. But that changed two hours before their departure, when Private Ko, one of Barthes's good comrades from Montlouis, took a bullet through the head. He was the first man they saw killed before their very eyes, and it caused them much pain. They buried Ko next to the trench gave one last look at his tomb that marked their passage through that dreadful place, then sprinted at full speed across the field that was constantly under fire from the German machine guns, and returned to Annika. They were assigned two days of rest. The poilus were lodged in abandoned houses in Annika and made themselves very comfortable. They could get coal from the nearby mine to warm themselves and, compared with the hell they had been through, these houses looked like paradise. Sometimes bullets would smack the walls and so they had to block the windows with mattresses. Other times their rest would be disturbed by a salvo of shells. But they no longer cared. It was nothing compared to their stay in the trenches. The rest of November was fairly calm, with only a few skirmishes. This was helped by the weather, which was very bad with copious amounts of rain, sleet and snow, which made any serious military action impossible. This impossibility did not bother the soldiers at all. Barthas comments that the following assignments to the front line were not as difficult as the first. The Poilus had started to set up little shelters where they could dig and rest between watch details, and they were finally issued tent cloths, one for every three men, though Barthas remarks that no one told them if they had to draw lots and let each man have it for a day, or if the small cloth had to be shared among all three soldiers at the same time. On the 1st of December they were at rest, dispersed across the red brick minor houses of Annika, where they had made themselves at home, when suddenly, around midnight, they received orders to hoist their sacks and get ready to depart. It was obvious that they were not heading back to the rear. That only left the front. Soon a company officer appeared and climbed up to the attic of their house. From the window he fixed his binoculars on Vermeer. The Poilus asked him what was going on, and the officer was willing to share some information. It turned out they were about to attack the Chateau de Vermeer, which was located at the entrance of the village and had been transformed into a fortress by the Germans. If the operation went well, then a general attack would be ordered. For this operation, French engineers had spent the last several days digging an underground mine in order to blow up the chateau. As a brief aside for those who do not know, mines were tunnels that were dug underground until they were below the enemy positions. Then the mines were filled to the brim with explosives and detonated, creating enormous explosions. Needless to say that this was an extremely dangerous and brutal form of warfare, and it was used by both sides during the First World War. But returning to the story, the explosion of the mine under the Chateau de Vermeil was set to go off at noon exactly, and the artillery bombardment and infantry attack would commence immediately afterwards. The soldiers trembled at the idea of becoming part of such an event, but sometimes curiosity is stronger than fear. To witness the attack, the Poilus in Anneka scrambled to the windows and clung to the walls or perched on rooftops across the town. They could see Vermel in the distance. At the appointed hour, the chateau disappeared in a massive cloud of smoke and a muffled detonation could be heard. Immediately, the French batteries, which had come closer during the night, opened fire and unleashed their hellish rain on Vermeil.
Taking advantage of the surprise on the German side, the neighboring regiment, the 296th, attacked, preceded by a detachment of skirmishers that had been given drink to excite their warriors' spirit. Their attack met only partial success. The 296th managed to take the chateau and its park, but when they tried to enter the town itself, they met stiff German resistance. The Germans had built barricades and trenches that cut across the streets and crenellated walls from which they could fire down on the French soldiers. Once the Germans recovered from the initial shock, they defended these positions fiercely, and the 296th could advance no more. Eventually, the attack was called off, and Barthes comments that it was not because of the casualties suffered by the 296th, but simply because a sustained attack by infantry alone, with no support, was impossible. All of this lasted barely three quarters of an hour. All soldiers were called down from alert status, and the joy on all of their faces was evident. Barthas admits that each one of them had wished for the operation to fail, so they wouldn't have to take part in it. They put their own lives first and the head of all the houses and coal in Vermel. After that, in the afternoon of the same day, Barthas was attached to the 21st Company, the one Barthas had wished to enter because of its Periasua captain and Barthas's childhood friend, Leon Houdel. Barthas joined the 13th Squad, also known as the Minerva Squad, because it was composed only of men from Periac Minerva and the vicinity. Barthes was greeted joyfully by his comrades, and the squad was placed under the command of a corporal from Toulouse, whose deputy Barthes became. The next evening they were sent up to the front line in relief of another unit. This time they were on the opposite bank of the stream that had previously flooded their trenches. Captain Houdel had brought up a large quantity of timbers from the coal mine in Aneca with the purpose of building both individual shelters as well as larger ones that could hold an entire squad safely. The day after that, the captain took Barthas to see all the improvements that he had carried out diligently in the sector. During their tour, the captain pointed towards an abandoned trench and asked Barthas to take a look. To his horror, Barthas discovered that to both sides of the trench, uncovered by landslides and rain, appeared skulls, feet, leg bones and skeletal hands all mixed up with rags, shredded packs, and other shapeless debris. Barthas was shocked, and the captain told him the story of that gruesome trench. Some time ago, one of his company sections had moved up to dig that trench. They had dug as fast and as deep as they could, because the next day they would have to man that very trench. At daybreak, the men saw silhouettes in the fog advancing towards them. Immediately, the sentinels sounded the alarm to go to arms, but the silhouettes cried out to not shoot, saying that they were English. Indeed, when they took a closer look, they saw that these men wore the caps of their allies, and given their close proximity to the English sector, it would not be unreasonable to find one of their patrols or work details lost in the fog and so the firing ceased immediately. But it turned out that these were not English, but Germans in disguise. With a savage war cry, they leapt into the trench and massacred the occupants. Some of the men tried to fall back to the lines behind them, but they were cut down before reaching them. Only a few managed to save themselves by hiding in the water and grass of the marshland. One of the men in Barthes' squad, a school teacher by the name of Mondier, had been in that trench and only managed to survive by spending several hours crouched in the freezing water. When he managed to return to the company, the captain brought him back to Anneka to recover and Mondier found a fish in his pocket, which he kept as a souvenir of that grim day.
His skin had turned completely black due to the prolonged exposure to the freezing water, but after it dried out it fortunately managed to recover its color. After the news of this surprise attack reached their lines, their colonel ordered the 21st company to retake the trench that very same day, no matter the cost. Barthas puts the reason rather bluntly. It was not to avenge our dead, because their number was likely to double, nor for the value of the terrain we had lost, which wasn't worth 10 francs. No, it was for our so-called honor and pride, and in reality, because it could constitute a black mark against the further advancement of our big bosses if this trench were not retaken. Having to follow orders, Captain Houdel insisted on artillery support for the attack. He personally went to the observation post in Anneka and pointed out to the artillerymen exactly where to fire. At 5 p.m. the battery opened a violent bombardment with mathematical precision on the occupied trench, which, due to having just been excavated, had no shelter of any sort. At night the captain sent a patrol to check the trench. The silence was absolute, and when the patrol entered the trench they found it filled with corpses. The only living person there was a wounded German who was taken prisoner. The trench was reoccupied, and the corpses were tossed to both sides of it and were covered with the earth that was shoveled out while deepening the trench itself. But the steady rains had slowly but surely uncovered the bodies, and in the end the trench was abandoned. A signpost at its entrance bore the name the soldiers had given it, Tranché de la Mort, the Trench of Death. There were only dead men there now. After this nasty surprise, the captain had demanded the utmost vigilance and rigorous surveillance measures. Barthas comments that, as usual with military life, they went from one extreme to another, and the men were exhausted with the extremely long hours of guard duty. And so life continued, but on December 7th they noticed an abnormal reduction in the shelling and firing from the German side. Then came complete silence. At the beginning a trap was suspected, but when patrols were sent forth they found that the German positions were empty. During the night their enemy had evacuated Vermel and the surrounding trenches. Barthes explains that this was not to please the French, but because the Germans had found themselves in an extended salient, exposed to enfilading fire from two directions. They had simply straightened their lines in order to make their positions more defensible. But the army big shots thought this was the great German retreat getting underway, just like the ones their newspapers announced daily. That day Barthes's company was at rest when they were all suddenly called to attention and sprang to action. They had to load all their provisions and vehicles. Their captain reminded them not to forget anything, because they were not coming back to Anneka. At noon, their march, or as their superiors called it, pursuit, began. They were assured that this was the great breakthrough, victory was smiling on them. Soon open warfare would start anew. That day their battalion would be in reserve, but they were promised that their turn would soon come. They left the village with no fear and soon passed by their previous trenches, now useless and abandoned. In front of them they could see the scout patrols advancing. Then rain started to fall heavily from the grey sky and their march turned into a slog through the mud. Then, suddenly, a few volleys of shells fell on the first columns from artillery covering the German retreat, and soon they started to hear the horrible sound of machine guns. They discovered that the Germans had posted themselves along the crest of an elevation above the plain in front of a village called oschille la -Bazé. This was not an unorganized German route. The Palus found themselves in front of organized and well-prepared positions 
that were ready for action, and their advance was immediately paralyzed. They were stuck in the middle of a swampy plain where they had to keep their heads to the ground because the air was filled with bullets. Confusion was absolute. Night soon arrived and the wind and rain only intensified. Looking for cover, the soldiers crawled into dugouts in an abandoned trench that soon turned into an extremely crowded trench. It was certain they would not be receiving a meal that evening. They were all chilled to the bone, soaking wet and caked in mud, and they all wondered how many hours or days they would have to stay there. Eventually, the voice of the company cyclist emerged from the darkness and announced that the 21st company would be heading back to Anaka to finish its three days of rest. They immediately left with no regrets. As they stumbled in the darkness and fell into shell holes filled with water, they wondered whether the night would be long enough to reach Anaka, even though it was barely three kilometers away. They finally reached the village in a miserable state, but were thankful for the opportunity to warm and dry themselves and to lie down on clean straw. They could imagine the suffering that was felt by the ones who had to spend the night on the flooded plain or up against the embankment of the railway where their new front line was being established. And so ended their day of victory. The next day's communique announced to France and the entire world that, after a brilliant combat, they had taken the town of Vermel and Le Routoir. Barthas comments sarcastically that they could not admit that they had simply occupied positions that had been abandoned by the enemy, who had fallen back to another, even stronger position. Barthas was furious at the use of the adjective brilliant to describe the battle on the dispatches, as if saying that after any battle there were no heads and chests riddled with holes, bellies burst open, or strips of flesh strewn across the fields. All battles brought death and suffering, and for him it was nothing but cynical to describe them as glorious or brilliant. The day after that, the 21st Company took their turn to occupy the new front lines. They passed by Vermel for the first time and were shocked by the destruction the town had suffered. There were almost no buildings left standing. Barthas comments that he was impressed by the apocalyptic sight at the moment, but later on in the war he saw other towns and villages in the same state or wars including some in which no buildings stood anymore and all that was left was a field of rubble. They set up camp in the beginnings of a trench two kilometers from Vermel. Throughout the night they had to either stand watch or work on expanding the trench. No one could rest or sleep. As soon as it got dark the Germans set fire to a hundred haystacks and the whole horizon seemed to be in flames. Clouds of smoke were brought by the wind to the Poilus positions, adding another discomfort to the night. Barthas wondered on why the Germans had burned all these haystacks instead of carrying them off. Did they have too many haystacks? Did they expect a stronger response from the French? He never knew the answer. In the morning, a heavy downpour put out the fires, but it made the smoke even worse and as it mingled with the fog, it made the night seem endless. During the day, the fog made it so they could work and move around in the open without fear of being seen, though at one point eagle-eyed German machine gunners spotted a squad from the company that was heading to Anaka to pick up some struts and beams, and started firing on them. Luckily, only one man was wounded. The night arrived early, as well as the terrible rain. The next day, the rain fell in torrents, without rest or interruption. It made them envy the frogs and other amphibians, who lived indifferently both on land and water. Once Barthes's guard duty was over, he would crouch down with his Periasa friend, Gabriel Gilles, into a small shelter they had made with three shovel handles and a tent cloth, 
to protect themselves from the rain. Others sheltered themselves as best they could with planks, blankets or knapsacks. Barthes comments that the only ones who didn't shelter themselves were the two school teachers from his squad, who, demoralized and discouraged, showed no initiative to fight against the elements and simply stood immobile for hours under the freezing rain, lower than even beasts of burden. On December 12th, they were relieved from that trench that had more in common with a sewer and were billeted on a farm near Anneka. As they arrived into the courtyard of the farm in the dark of night, Barthes comments that they forgot about the inevitable pools of water which were common in all the farms of the north, hiding under straw and dung. This resulted in many soaked feet, legs and bottoms for most of them. But they no longer cared if they were slightly wetter than before, and soon found dry straw on which to lie down, rest and dry. The day after the next, in the afternoon, they were assembled for roll call. At the end of roll call, the sergeant major suddenly told them in an indifferent voice that the next day at 5 a.m. the 21st and 24th companies would go on the attack. Departure was set for that evening at 6 p.m. And then, without another word, the sergeant left. The men stood there, dumbfounded, in shock. Some did not seem to understand what had just happened. Others understood far too well that this would mean death for some of them. Barthes complained that some officers who took their job seriously would have made a point of giving them some information and comforting words, but none of theirs took the trouble to make the effort. After that, they ate their evening meal without much appetite, and each man was given 250 cartridges and rations for two days. The captain asked for 40 volunteers to march in the vanguard of the company. In practice, this was little more than committing suicide, and there was not a single volunteer, so lots had to be drawn to determine which section would be assigned to the vanguard. It was not Barthes's section. They left Anneka in a moonless night. They followed the railway line, which had been destroyed by shellfire. In the darkness, every few steps, one tripped and stumbled on splintered ties, pieces of rail and fallen telegraph poles. After two hours of marching, they reached the place where they had to set up their positions for the attack. It was a former German trench. They were all tired scratched and bruised, and still had to wait for dawn in the cold. To cover three kilometers, their superiors had made them leave 14 hours early, at the height of winter. There were some empty dugouts that were immediately occupied by the Poilus, but Barthas, being one of the last to arrive, found no empty spot inside the dugouts or on the trench floor. Overcome with fatigue, he simply rolled himself up with his raincoat and blanket and sat down next to a tree with no leaves exposed to the wind. He fell asleep and his dreams swiftly went to his home and family and the happy memories of a far happier past. Suddenly, a hand grabbed his shoulder and shook him. Barthas woke up with a start, terrified. It seemed that a Bosch had surprised him and was attacking him. But it turned out to be his friend, Gabriel Gilles, who was looking for him and told him that the attack order had been revoked and a new order was sending them back to the village. The soldiers did not try to discover the reason for being recalled and simply left. Two hours later, they would be sleeping back in their previous billets. And here ends the second notebook, with the sufferings and terrors of living in the trenches and the menace of being sent on an attack against well-prepared enemy positions. At least for now, this attack order seems to fortunately have gone nowhere. On the next episode, we will continue the story with Barthes' third notebook. <laughs>
and look further into what the early stages of trench warfare in 1914 were like. Thank you for your attention. Until next time.